Hello, my name is Luis. I'm a PhD student at the Catholic University of America and a research assistant at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Well, uh, this, this work is outcome of the Frontier Development Lab 2019 spring, and the results of this presentation has been accepted for publication. So I will put the link to the preprint available at archive. Well, thank you all for being here. I know it's quite late in some time zones, so let's start. Well, this is the NASA's Heliophysics System Observatory, HSO. Uh, it is composed of, it, it is a fleet of satellites that monitor the sun 24 seven and provide crucial and uh, crucial data for us to understand the sun. But some, some of these satellites, such as the Solar Dynamic Observatory, SDO, uh, the Solar Orbiter and Stereo have uh, extreme ultraviolet uh, imagers, which suffers from a steady degradation through time. Because of this, it is required the continued calibration of these instruments, and uh, which can be complicated. For STO, which is which is close to Earth, uh, it can rely on frequent flights of sounding rockets. But for some missions like solar orbiter and stereo, which are deep space missions, this is not an option. And calibrating these instruments can become quite challenging. Quite challenging. But uh, what I mean by degradation, so. Here are example of three, uh, six images from AIA, which is on board STO. So from uh, 211 channel, 304 channel, and 335 channel. Uh, on the top row, we uh, it, it's an image taken at uh, May 13th, 2010, the early days of the STO mission. And in the bottom row is images uh, taken at August 31st, 2020, which is recent last year. So you can see the images on the bottom are much, much uh, dimmer than the top ones. So this is due to the degradation. The instrument keeps losing sensitivity and the images become dimmer. So we need to calibrate the instrument. We need to calibrate these images to have a, a, a good data to, to work on. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, AIA at STO relies on the sounding rockets, uh, frequent sounding rocket experiments but in May 2014, the EVE MAX A, uh, one instrument at STO, stopped its operations and it af affected directly the calibration of EUV channels of AIA. So, if uh, so, SDO calibration become quite challenging now, uh, and we already have some some calibra challenging calibrations of solar orbiter and uh, at stereo. So, how can we solve this? The main, the main goal of this project is to develop a, a novel method based on machine learning that exploits spatial patterns on the solar surface observation to auto-calibrate the EUV instruments in these satellites. Okay, so to do this, we're gonna rely, to do this work, we're gonna rely on the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which has the sounding rockets experiment so we can compare our, our results. SDO is a, a suite of three instruments, the Atmospheric Image, Imaging Assembly, AIA, which provides full disk observations of the solar photosphere, chromosphere, and the corona. Uh, it, uh, it also has the helioseismic and the magnetic imager, HMI, which provide 4K by 4K uh, pixel vector magnetogram and dot programs over the entire visible solar disk. And the last instrument is the extreme ultraviolet extreme ultraviolet variability experiment, EVE. Uh, but in this work, we're gonna focus mostly on AIA and a little bit of HMI, okay? So to, to develop our machine learning uh, uh, method, we're gonna use the STO machine learning data set provided by Galvez et al, 2019. Uh, this data set have, they have data from 2010 to 2020. Uh, with a temporal resolution of six minutes for AIA and 12 minutes for, it, uh, for HMI. Uh, all the images are corrected for instrumental degradation over time and, and uh, also for exposure time. This, uh, this data set is composed from seven EUV channels, two UV channels and uh, HMI data. The total size of this data set is about seven terabytes. Well, so we have the motivation, uh, we have the data set. So how can we formulate our problem? So the idea here is we get we get the graded image, we give as input to our model, uh, and our model has has an output of uh, 
how much how much these images degraded what is the dim the, the, the dimmed factor so with the dim factor we can recover the original brightness of the image well uh, we decided to go with our artificial degradation so we degree, we, we use the data set which already been corrected for degradation we we randomly degraded the images by a factor of alpha, which is sample from uh, a uniform distribution of 0.01 to one. With the greatest image we give to the model and the output of the model, we compare it with the value that we use to degrade and see if the, if the model can predict a closer value. Uh, well, that's our idea. Yeah, that's, that's the formulation of our problem. So. How is your our model? So first, we started with a, a simpler model, which uh, used as input uh, one channel image. So we have two convolutions with max pooling, uh, followed by fully connected layer, uh, followed by sigmoid and output of uh, uh, a single value. The single value is the uh, the alpha. So this value is how much this image was degraded. In this case, we degraded artificially, as I mentioned before. Well, but if you look at the images at the bottom, these are seven channels from AIA. And you can see there are some, some structures that you can see more than one channel. So in some brightness that you can see more in one channel and somehow they are correlated. So uh, we decided to explore this uh, cross-channel correlation and we developed a second architecture that uh, used as input seven the seven channel UV channels of AIA as input. So it passed against through the two convolutions with max pooling, a fully connected layer followed by a sigmoid. And then we have seven, out, seven uh, values as output. Each, each value is the degradation factor for one of these channels. Uh, we expected, again, we expected this, this architecture to find some correlation, some uh, correlation between brightness in different Channel, some cross-channel correlation, and 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 use these to to better recover the degradation factor. So we have the model. So how how did we train it? So uh, to train, we use the da data from 2010 to 2013. Uh, so in the months from January to July, we used to train the model. In the months from August to October, we used to test the model. So it's our test data. The cadence we use is every six hours. And all the data we use as input is artificially degraded uh, using, uh, by a random factor, as I mentioned earlier. So as a loss function, we use the mean square error of the distance between the predicted degradation factor and the growth of degradation factor. Uh, the model was trained by a thousand epoch. And the metric we use to evaluate our model here is the uh, called success rate. So we take the absolute difference from the predicted alpha by the model minor uh, the different predict alpha by the model and the ground tooth alpha if this different this absolute difference is smaller than a tolerance uh, we consider a success if it's greater than a than the tolerance we consider a failure uh, we I, I didn't put a specific tolerance here because we use different tolerance and we're going to see them in the results part well besides that uh, we before giving the image to input, we decided to remove the sun's limb. This way we forced the model to only uh, take in account structures inside the sun and not some weird brightness pixel that is uh, on the limb of the sun to recover the dimming factor. This way we are forcing it to only look at the, the center part of the sun. But how, uh, with what can we compare our results? So we define a baseline. Our baseline is pretty simple. We get a reference image at the early days of the mission, so at t equals to zero. Uh, we crop the center of this image, and with this image crop, we put a mask to only get the the, the, the quiet sun. So so we mask uh, pixels that have magnetic field greater than five maxels per centimeter squared. For to find this magnetic field, we we use the HMI data. So we mask the active regions, we kept only the quiet sun, and we plot a histogram of intensity uh, of this reference image. We do the same process for a, a dimmed image, I image that was taken later, one or two years later. 
and we do the same process and we plot the histogram. In the histogram, we identify the most probable variable for the reference image and the dimmed image. When we take the ratio of the most probable value of the dimmed image and the reference image, we have alpha, we have our dimming factor. This is the factor we are looking at. So this is at the baseline, what we're gonna compare our result with. And well, so we, let's see the results. So this is the, the, the mean success rate uh, for the three different models. In the bottom, you can see the legends for the colors. So each color is a different tolerance uh, our, for our success rate. So the blue is point, uh, absolute 0 0.05 value. Uh, the orange is uh, uh, relative 5%, gray is relative 10%, yellow is relative 50%, and uh, bluish is uh, relative 20% tolerance. Well, you can see in every single tolerance, uh, the multi-channel model outperforms the other two models. So definitely the cross-channel cross, cross -channel correlation helps the model predict better the degradation factor, the dimming factor, okay? Uh, even though uh, this, the, the single-channel model still do a very, very good job, is still predicting very well the dimming, uh, the dimming factors, much better than our uh, the baseline we define. Okay. Uh, so this is a good result. This is a success result. Uh, but if please go to the papers uh, in archive, uh, we put a much much in depth discussion there of how how what these results imply and uh, how these results. Uh, uh, what were results by channel, by tolerance, and uh, where there's a, a good in-depth discussion there. Well, continuing, uh, so these results were testing with our test data, but moving forward, we decided to compare uh, how our model could reconstruct the degradation curve. So we test our model with raw data from 2010 until 2020 to reconstruct the degradation curve and compare that with the results from the sounding rockets of STO. So the solid black line is the, uh, the degradation curve from uh, sounding, sounding, sounding rocket experiment V9. The gray line is the experiment V8 from the sounding rocket. The solid colorful line is the multi-channel and the dashed colorful line is from the single channel model. So the shaded area is the 28% estimate error for the V9 uh, curve, which is the most updated curve. Uh, so you can see that our single model and multi-channel model performs really well. So it always within the, the, the error of the V9 curve and also it's not as, it's, 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 it's pretty close uh, uh, to the, to the degradation curves predicted by the, the uh, sounding rocket. So, so these are for, for different channels. You can see, for example, for the 131, it, it, it matches really well. Uh, also the same for 171. For the other three channels, here's the results. Again, for the 304, we, uh, our model matches really well the degradation curve. Uh, and the same happens for 335. So these are definitely a success, a successful results. And uh, so these are the take, here are the takeaways. Uh, well, the, the deep learning model was successful to the recorded dimming factors and perf performed much better than the baseline. Uh, the hypothesis that the multi-channel model could find some cro cross channels correlation, cross channel correlations and uh, perform better than the single channel model also turned out to be true. We, we, uh, uh, we could see that with the success rate. Also, how this procedure could be applied to different missions. So we could use data from different missions to, to, to the early, early, year, early data from different missions to train the model and then use the model to calibrate the rest of the data. Okay, well, uh, thank you for your time and see you later.